Bird, 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 bird. Feeling, I'm feeling spry. Hey, everybody. It's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast, brought to you by our title sponsor, On X Hunt. Now, they do so much for the show and so much for the Upland Institute and for us just navigating and finding places to hunt and fish and kayak and back road and off road, whatever, whatever you do outside, Onyx has got your back. But you know what else they got? They're helping to make places. And what do I mean by that is they had the Onyx 40X after party at Pheasant Fest, and I just got the results. I was listening to Ben on Travis's show that just yesterday. The Onyx after party raised $50,000. Pheasants Forever can take that and get forty times that with matching funds from different state and federal agencies. So that means Onyx just threw $2 million at the habitat that we love to play in. That's right. It might not be all grasslands, but it's going to be a lot of things that make a lot of difference for a lot of critters out there. And so that's the kind of support they have. Yeah, they should be your title sponsor. Pike gear should be what you're wearing when you're out there. Technical clothing for the Upland Hunter. You're not going to find a more complete set of Upland gear. I mean, if they sold boots, we'd, we'd, be, we'd be buying their boots, I'm telling you. But you know what else they're doing? They're a major sponsor of the Rough Grouse Society. That is my nearest and dearest organization to my heart. And this Tuesday, the 21st, at 8 p.m., Pike's YouTube channel is going to do a live event with RGS, and it's going to talk about their membership. It's going to be a great chance for you to ask questions. You can act, literally interact live with the, the Rough Grouse Society and Pike Gear and find out what's going on in your neck of the woods, what's going on in the country, how the woodcock, how the grouse are doing, all that stuff. Now, of course, you could watch it later on Pike Gear's YouTube channel, but you won't be able to ask a question unless you tune in 8 p.m. this Tuesday. So there. There. And unless you got Boss shot shells in your game bag or your, your ammo pouch, you stand a much bigger chance of just winging that bird or crippling that bird. Because Boss copper-plated bismuth is deadly. Just freaking deadly. And don't forget, Tyler and I are going to be down there in June. We don't have everything buttoned up. We don't have every I, I dotted or every T crossed yet. But we're going to have an event down at Boss Shot Shells in Bridgeton, Michigan in the beginning of June. And you can find out about what they do for you. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Don't, you know, me and Tyler are going to be there. It's going to be fun. It, you want some more fun? Don't go in your freezer and look and see how much you got this year. Now, I know some of you deer hunt and, you know, do some other things. But you know what? Do the birds that you shoot a favor. Go to Walton's. And if nothing else, look at their spices. They have a spice for everything. Now, I would never make pheasant sausage. I don't have enough pheasants to make pheasant sausage, but they have a spice for it. I guarantee it. Get the Walton's catalog and turn yourself into a wild game kitchen because they got everything but the meats because you got the meat. They do. Gunner has everything to keep your dog safe, which means the only, the only crash-tested kennel that could survive, well, a crash. And your dog has a much better chance of survival in a kennel like that. Don't take a chance. Put them in the safest kennel made. And you know what? Put your Purina food, put your Purina food in the best dog food crate ever made. That food crate, and I, I, I cannot stress to you enough, if, if you were in that tragic accident on a hunting trip with your, your gunner kennels back there, not only would the gunner kennels be fine and the dog would be fine, the food will be fine. That, that food crate is as tough as their kennels, and all their stuff is guaranteed for life. You heard me. You buy it once, you don't have to buy it again, and that does not hold true with everything out there in the outdoor world. You get Garmin around your dog's neck, and you have got with more professional trainers use across this country. You, I, I did a survey with some of my Patreon patrons, 
And guess what? It was like, what did I say? 85% Garmin? Like, f- please. I didn't, get, I didn't get 85% on any of my other sponsors' stuff, but the one thing that rings true in the dog training and tracking world is Garmin. And the one place to buy it is W Hunting Supply. That is the one place. When you deal with W, they understand your sense of urgency. They could understand your sense of confusion. They will help you troubleshoot. They will help you reprogram. They will, they will expedite you next day. They'll send the Pony Express out with a brand new collar for you. I mean, if you were close enough to their shop. Otherwise, they will use the means of I know people that have literally been on a hunting trip. They thought it was going to be ruined. They had nowhere to get another a replacement because things happen. You know, a battery could go bad. So you drop your trip. Whatever happens, you get a hold of W, and they're going to take care of you like family. They absolutely will take care of you like family. Purina takes care of your dog like family because Purina is, I mean, it should be an encyclopedia. If you just looked up dog food, it should just come up Purina. That's it. I mean, simple, right? There shouldn't be any other names. There shouldn't be any other acronyms. It should just be Purina. Dog food equals dog food equals the best thing you can have for your dog. And most of my listeners feed Purina. That's amazing because most of my listeners are intelligent. and They understand that food has been made for over 100 years, and they know what they're doing. They do. Now, Canine Athlete has not been around for 100 years, but they knew a little something else for your dog that would be really really beneficial and they developed hydrate and recover and new dog and probiotics it's all those little things that we can do extra just like you know how people drink water i I never drank water when i was a kid i think i drank it out of a puddle or a hose bib on the side of a house but everybody's taking vitamins and supplements why not do that for your dog canine athlete has everything you could do to help your dog have a better day in the field especially when he's a working dog putting some miles in the hydrate and recover is essential. You will, you, will, you will never see it in the short term, but that dog is going to last longer in the long term. And that's brought to you by Wilderness Athlete. They have the same products for you, that you, the human you, but they take care of your dogs because it's owned by a man who's a houndsman. And he said, damn it, we're going to make, we're going to make what we make for people for dogs. Right. And, uh, and that's it. Don't forget... Now, I haven't thanked my patrons yet, and I, there's a reason. I want to update you on my patrons, okay? But I want to remind you that the HDP store is open. You just go to the Hunting Dog Podcast website. You can find the store link, and you can get, you can get everything from a, a koozie to a neck gaiter to a water bottle to a onesie for that newborn baby in your life or in your family's life or your cousins or your neighbors. And it says, I'm feeling spry, just like me. I feel spry. So go to the Upland Institute. Uh, No, so don't. God, Ron, I'm not going to redo this. No, I'm not going to redo it. Check out the HTP store and check out Upland Institute, okay? We're going to have some new stuff coming up on Upland Institute brought to you by Onyx, right? And uh, it's going to be exciting. There's just going to be a little more stuff, a little more. We're going to get into the minutia, but... What I wanted to talk about was our, my Patreon patrons. We've had a, a wonderful uh, response to the series I'm doing once a week, and the, my patrons get this. And basically, I'm taking my new pup. Uh, more details on her later. I think a few of you know what happened and where I got this pup from, but I'll leave it to you to figure out. Of course, Patreon patrons know about it because I told, told them about this pup two months ago when they come to the Zoom room, which we'll have next uh, next Wednesday. It's usually on Thursdays. But Patreon patrons, every Thursday, my daughter comes over with her grandson, and she is f- tracking the progress I'm making with Zuka, my little female. And uh, we're working on, st- not studying, we're working on table manners. We're working on food manners. We're working on crate training. We're working on leash manners. Taking the pages right out of the Upland Institute into this little dog. And I'm also transferring it over and showing Tagus where he is because of what I did with him using the Upland Institute. So, you know what? You can find places to hunt. You can have great gear on your back. You can have the best shotgun shells. You can have the best seasonings for your food. You can have your dog in the greatest crate, the best collar around its neck, the best food in its belly. But if it isn't trained, yeah, I think you're missing something. 
Yeah. So that's what Patreon patrons can get. And they can always get a discount. All I have to do is rate me because you are on my team. Yep. For, for, from day one, you're on my team. You don't have to be a two-year member. You just join Patreon and give me an email. Give me a message. I'll get it. I'll respond. I'll talk to you. I, I, I think I've talked to at least half of all the patrons I have because I, I don't like typing an answer. There's, there's too many questions to ask, and a lot of patrons are brand new to the dog world and like, oh, I didn't know I could call you. Or they'll send me a message, and I'll say, send me the number, and they're like, really? You're going to call me? Well, I'm not a freaking celebrity. I'm just an idiot with a podcast and knows a lot about dogs and happens to be the co-producer of the Upland Institute. I can help you. So there's another reason. This episode, wow, this turned into 10 minutes, and I did not plan on that. Um. This episode is with Jeff Funky. Jeff and I met each other years ago. We were both n- judges for NAVDA. Jeff left a few years ago. As most of you know, I am not, not a, ju- a judge any longer. Um, but, but my new favorite testing organization, I will be a judge for. Um, I was on the phone with Jeff. We talked about the Federation. This is the Versatile Hunting Dog Federation. Okay? Not... Not the other one. This is the Versatile Hunting Dog Federation. They do things a little more different, a lot more hunt-centric, okay? A lot more realistic. This is the way, this is the way things were done years ago, but Jeff didn't want to see that go by the wayside. The real evaluation of a dog or a litter of dogs is important, and the Federation, the way we score dogs at the Federation, you hear me say we? I already said we. I haven't even gone to the judges' workshop yet. Yes, I'm going to have to go to a judge's workshop, even though I've been a judge for 20, 25 years. But I need to learn their scoring system and apply my years of knowledge to it. And I'll be judging for the VDHF, Versatile, Dog Hunt, Versatile Hunting Dog Federation. I, I got to get used to that uh, acronym. VDHF, Versatile, no, VHD, VHDF. Well, Anyway, Jeff is a great guy, knows more about, he's forgot more about wire hairs than I remember, um, and he is also part of the Wire Hairs Breeders Alliance. Yeah, that's another episode coming up. A lot of things are changing in the Upland world, and the Versatile Hunting Dog Federation is one of them. Talk to you. Bye. Mr. Well, Funky, are you there? I am. All right. I am, Ron. How are you? Good. Everybody, this is Jeff Funky. Uh, Jeff Jeff and I had the pleasure, I don't know if it was a pleasure for Jeff, it was a pleasure for me. Years ago, we judged together, and I think it was in Wisconsin. Um, it was. But, yeah, and, uh, and I remember being slightly afraid of you. <laughs> <laughs> you, you. You had a presence in the, in the judging field that I think now that NAVDA does not care for. You, you have to look less scary. You, you're, you're a big, strong guy. <laughs> I, I will make note of that. Okay. All for right. my future assignments. Yes. Try to get a more diminu- diminutive type judges, you know, that wouldn't hurt anybody's feelings or say anything out of turn or anything like that. Um, but Jeff, we're going to, what, what people are going to hear about a lot today is, uh, is about the, um, Versatile Hunting Dog Federation, and uh, and Jeff is the, I guess you'll call it the brainchild, the CEO, the CFO, and the uh, chief cook and bottle washer. But before that, Jeff, because I don't know your history, give us a little background. Grew up hunting dogs, you know, until you got into the the judging world. Yeah, well, um, so went to University of Idaho, and hunting fishing was outstanding so i decided uh the summer of my freshman year i needed a bird dog so i found a a wire hair after i got done bear hunting in the the selway crags i found a nice wire hair puppy and that next year set my classes so i was only going to college on tuesdays and thursdays <laughs> And the rest of the time I was hunting and I actually was able to decrease my class time down from 
less than two days a week because I found out that a lot of the college professors like to hunt behind a good bird dog too. So um, <laughs> it was a little quid pro quo there and uh, it worked out well. And came down to the Boise area after that. And a lot of people saw my bird dog and said, man, that's the nicest dog I've seen. You really need to breed that dog. I didn't know anything about it. Joined NAVDA, tested the dog. The first test was a little bit of a disaster because I didn't know what, what the program was exactly. But second test, uh, that, that dog got a prize one and we bred her to a nice male and you know, the rest, the rest is history. I, I got to jump back to that because I'm guessing the years, you know, from when I started, you did this before me, as far as the, uh, the dog progression, because you were a judge way before me. So you had a prize one female wire hair. That's back when prize ones were kind of rare, right? They definitely, uh, I think that back then you, you definitely, most tests you didn't see a prize one at. It was pretty rare. Yeah. And so was this, did you do a great job of training or do you, did you get one of those just great dogs on top of everything else? She was a good dog and I did a lot of training and hunting with her. And that's the, the hunting's got to help the most, I'm sure. You know? Yeah, exactly. I could, I could go, you know, 15 minutes from my, my house and I was duck hunting potholes and, and things like that. So. She just got all kinds of real world experience. And then, and then, so the only, you're, I'm guessing your obstacle would have been healing and, and probably didn't even have to worry about search for duck if she'd been hunting wild ducks and going after pothole ducks. Right, right. No, she did a, in fact, uh, on the, the search for duck that I can still remember to this day, the, the judges were laughing because she was, she was treading water trying to sneak so slowly on the, on the duck after she'd tracked it down. Uh, she knew how to, you know, grab a cripple. <laughs> <laughs> I can picture that. I can picture that. And then of course, uh, steady to wing shot and fall for that, for that score. Did, where did you pick up your dog training from at that point? Cause you're pretty yeah. young. I'm guessing, and you know, you probably didn't know shit from Shinola except how to do a class schedule. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> Uh, and I don't know that I knew that too well either, but no, I was totally self-taught except for, I trained that dog with, um, two pigeons that I kept in a cardboard box that I got from a gentleman named Joe Callanan. He was a, a allergist in, in Boise and I, his, one of his sons used to pick me up and take me to school and that's how I met him and he knew I had this bird dog and he gave me two pigeons and I literally trained that dog, no launchers, no nothing, just two pigeons and a piece of cardboard and a string. And that's, that's what we did the steadiness with. <laughs> so, so, okay. Now are we going back to like, is your telephone two soup cans and a string? <laughs> yes, come on. But, I, I, I listen, I'm not, I'm not that old. You're older than I am, but I, I, I might know. have started in Navda before you did, but you're definitely older than I am. So I, I am. You know how that stuff goes. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, I think that's, we're going to, like I said, you know, this podcast is going to go all over the place, but you just gave me like, I, I, I get so much uh, communication from patrons and listeners. And, and I mean, it's amazing how many people, like when you're in some form of the dog world, you've been in it forever. I'm sure you get like, what do I do? How do I do it? And you almost want to say, uh, we get two pigeons in a cardboard box. I'll show you what to do. <laughs> you know? and, I mean, and that's, that flies in the laughs in the face of what we do now. Sometimes, you know, the people get the dogs and the birds early. They, they set up situ. It's almost like they create their own problems and, my first wire hair that I had success with, I went to a clinic, a nav that, well, it was put on by Purina. Um, and Clyde Vetter had to step in for the clinic leader and it was just on the trained retrieve. And he, he had a training table, the chapter brought him a training table. 
And what he said you could do on a training table amazed me. And I literally steadied up my first wire hair with that old, remember the old pole with the pulley and the pigeon, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> People don't know what I'm talking about, but it was in the book, right? Right. <laughs> you put the dog on the table and you put a pigeon up on a pole with a pulley and a string and you popped it up like a marionette puppet. <laughs> <laughs> Except it they never, they never, it does work, except what they never told you about that was you had to redo it once you put the dog back on the ground. <laughs> well, that's a slight little, just a little, <laughs> you, well, I just brought the table to the train, you know, to the test day. I said, my dog hunts from the table. <laughs> it was very, it was very inconvenient as I had to make back straps to carry the, the bench out into the field when he went on point. But uh, I thought the judges thought I was crazy, but um no, you're right, but it's amazing what you did with, like you said, two birds. I, I heard a, a gal back in the day, way back in the day, um, for her duck search with her Weimariner, and she she went all the way. She was the first, I would say, the first good Wyme, if you remember Judy Baylog name at all, Jeff. Oh, yeah. And uh, she had three ducks, and that's what she trained her dog on for two years with three ducks. Yeah, and and did her duck search work and got all maximum scores all the way through. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's that's got to be a good dog, no question. That that's the other part of it. I think. Uh, yeah, you can definitely take a mediocre dog and with a lot of bird contact and make it a much better dog, especially in a a situational training uh, area like like a duck search. Or something like that, but I, yeah. I I gotta think, you know, in in her case, in that dog's name was Chelsea. She, I I don't know that I had ever bought any ducks for. I don't know that I put her on any domestic ducks, uh, to be honest with you. But um, I might have. I just can't remember if right. I got one. If I did, it was very few. Right. If you did, you showed up somewhere and somebody said, hey, I got an extra duck. You're like, oh, OK, you know, but that dog had a lot of real world duck experience, too. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the other thing that helped with the steadiness is uh, University of Idaho is up in the Palouse. Uh, a lot of huns up there in wheat stubble fields and they don't hold they don't stick around very long if you're moving on point. So um, that helped as well. So she pretty, she, it sounds like she got pretty staunch just from hunting those birds. And yeah, to the, to the, to the flush for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and then at that point too, with a lot of wild bird contacts, they kind of learn not, there's no point in chasing them. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, they know better than that. Yeah. It just wastes time. I remember Justin, who I worked on the Upland Institute with, he said, you know why dogs, you know, why dogs, Dogs shouldn't chase birds just because coyotes don't chase birds. <laughs> he said, I watched a coyote try to sneak up on a sharp tail once and it was unsuccessful. But what he didn't do was waste a tank of gas trying to chase the bird down. <laughs> uh, um, Justin is uh, correct. Yeah, no, he's he's he knows what he's talking about for sure. Um. So how many years did you, did you judge for, for NAVDA, Jeff? Oh, I think I started in 94. Might've been a little before that. Uh, definitely started apprenticing before that, but uh, no, it, yeah, it was before that because I ran the Invitational in 94. So I think oh, wow. I started judging in 92 and um and then I resigned. I just got too busy with this, the VHDF project. I think it was 2012 gotcha. when I resigned. So, and, and I want to, I want to make this clear for those who don't know anything. Um, you know, the, the acronyms North American versatile hunting dog association is who I judged for who Jeff judged for. And when we're talking about versatile hunting dog federation, this is what you start. So you were working on that. What was the the antithesis or the 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 driving force? What what was the reason? Yeah. yeah. So that, believe it or not, that that actually the 
genesis of that was founded at at a um, judge's workshop for NAVDA, <clears throat> which was in Reno, Nevada, which was, <laughs> I think, the one before uh, my wife found you on the bus on the way to the motel when you needed a beer. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. I always forget about that story. <laughs> uh, yeah, we we saved you because you were you know, it's not easy to get into the Reno airport sometimes. And I think no. you had a pretty bad flight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Getting in there. And uh, she, she saw you on the bus and, and, and you might've had a nav to hat on or no, I don't think you did. I think you just look so flustered. She, she's a really kind person and she likes to help people. And I think she just offered to help you. And then you guys started talking and, and next thing you know, we, we were one big happy family at the at the Silver Legacy in uh, oh, Reno, Nevada. But yeah, that, but, I remember. Everybody says, "Yeah, yeah, that's what it's like landing in Reno." I'm like, "Well, fuck living in Reno. <laughs> <laughs> that airport apparently it gets some kind of wind shear from the side, you know." <laughs> yeah. Well, you got mountains on both sides, so uh, you know Donner Pass, the Sierra Nevadas on the one side. Oh, uh, they they've had. Uh, this year they've had well over 600 inches of snow. Oh, um, it's it's unbelievable. You ought to look at look go go look at Mammoth, California, and, and look at their snow levels. It's it's incredible. Um, but I I it, you know so they used to rotate that workshop back then. They rotated it um, every year from east to Midwest to west. Right. And so it would have been, I think it was held at that location, maybe three years. And so it was either one or two workshops before the, before the one that I met you at. So it was either three years or six years before that. And they were, they had just rewritten the rules for the UPT test, the preparatory test. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, that committee was primarily comprised of uh, uh, Bob West and Jack Lulak, and the, really the test didn't go over very well with a lot of people, and a lot of the judges there said, you know, we really need like a breeder's test, something in between that doesn't require so much obedience that mm -hmm. masks the natural herded abilities of the dog it'd be nice for for breeders and i know the invitational is a big deal now and and that's that's where everybody goes but there's something to be said for the, well the, the poodle pointer alliance does it they they look at primarily at natural ability scores and and they're very successful with that and so yeah. we were looking for something at a little bit higher level. And a number of the judges that were at that, we all, you know, how it goes sitting around after yeah, the meetings, yeah. you know, talking about it, brainstorming. And a number of people came up with the idea and everybody liked it. And um, of course, nobody acted on it. And then a number of years down the road for whatever reason, we decided to act on it. And um, of course, most of the people that were initially interested in it didn't want anything to do with it at that time. But myself and Joe Schmutz, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've met Joe Schmutz, the, the large Munsterlander breeder mm -hmm. out of Saskatchewan. Uh, brilliant guy. He's probably done more academic work on dog test scores than than anybody on the planet. Um, his wife, Sheila, is a, is a color geneticist. Um, and, you know, they, they've just put a, their whole lives into bird dogs and genetics and, and all of that. So I asked him if he was interested in starting it. Initially, he said no. And then he called me back. He said, yeah, let's do this. And, uh, my, and then Bodo Winterhelt at the time was very interested in creating it for, at the time they had the PCNA 
uh, Food Pointer Club of North America. Right. And they wanted to participate. And so we formed a little committee and the other person on the committee that I think was um, instrumental, uh, I think you've actually interviewed him before was Ed Bailey. Oh yeah, uh, I interviewed him a few years, well, probably six, seven years ago, yeah. Yeah, so he was also on that committee. So we, we went about to set it up and we, I think we had our first meeting in uh, back in Reno in, in uh, 2008, um, there were there were a lot of people at that meeting. I there were over 30 people there. A lot of different breed clubs and people that were interested, and so mm -hmm. we eventually wrote the rules and and it started off uh, with um, tests in Idaho, Oregon, Canada, and eventually expanded to. California, Washington, Minnesota, uh, Michigan, and uh, one of your states. And then um, most recently, there's a outfit in Pennsylvania that's that's doing a lot of a lot of testing. So yeah, with Kyle, right? Yes, with Kyle. Yep. Yeah. In fact, I well, I'll jump on that later because it looks like there's the judges workshop, and I. I would be interested in attending that if it's if there's an opening for it. So yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and it's not like so. Explain to people the like again. I I don't know what the percentage of my uh, listening audience. It certainly has a large NAVDA following, so people are familiar with the natural ability test that tested natural inherited qualities of a dog that it you know got from its parents. What your what was diff what's different about your your aptitude test than the natural ability test jeff yeah so vhdf wanted to incorporate incorporate a few just different things um navda I i'm a lifetime member of navda it's a, a incredible organization um and i got you know i cut my teeth there and i learned a lot there and met um incredible people there and it it definitely um dominates the versatile dog world and it, as well you know as it should um incredible infrastructure with navda what are as a breeder though and i think that's as a breeder and a hunter a wild bird hunter yeah i think we we look for a few different things and when navda first started and when I first joined in NAVDA, it was primarily a breeders and a hunters organization. It, it helped breeders determine genetics and which dogs to move forward with. And it helped hunters train their dogs and pick their dogs and that sort of thing. Right. As NAVDA evolved over the years, and this is not, this is not a secret or a, or a jab at NAVDA, they purposefully did this. I was on the board of NAVDA, I was director of promotions I was director of testing. I was a senior judge. I was a clinic leader. Uh, we talked about this all the time, moving from a loose knit breeders, hunters organization to a dog sport. Um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That, that was the goal. And we actually strategized for that. But in doing so, you put more weight into the obedience and the training than you do into the heritage categories. So right. as that's why the invitational is now the major focus. And it's, you know, it's a wonderful event. I had a great time at the ones that I went to and uh, had the time of my life in, in 94 at the one that I went to uh, where we had two dogs pass. But from a breeding standpoint, you've got the natural ability test and it, when you start to look at VHDF, we say, okay, you get a four, which is the maximum score in NAVDA. Right. Um, um, then we need, uh, no, we had, a, we had an intruder. <laughs> I, my dogs are going to start barking because they hear your dogs. Hey, <laughs> there they go. Edit, edit moment. Oh, that's okay. Um, this is real. 
So now the, with a four, which we all, we all know is, you know, somewhere around a 75% or above. Right. Um, if I'm sitting in, you know, um, Patagonia, Arizona, and I see a dog in uh, um, Pennsylvania that gets a four, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know exactly what that means. So one of the things we thought was super important was a 10 point system and VHDF uses a 10 point system, a more granular scoring system yeah. that gives you more detail. Um, and it's actually 10 point plus it goes to 11 and 12, which is, we can talk about later if you want, but, but yeah. for simplicity right now, you know, a 10 is a hundred percent, uh, a nine, nine is 90%. Is a 10 uh, would be like, you didn't find anything wrong with that dog, basically, right? It did I mean, everything you would expect yeah. for a dog of that age in that category to do. It, yeah. And, yeah. And so I think it, it gives you a lot better data to make breeding decisions with to learn who the, um, you know, the value of the parents, the genetic value of the parents. So... I, and I, I haven't looked at these statistics in a long time, but I know at one point in time, it was something like 60 some percent of all NAVDA NA dogs were earning a prize one. Right. Um, so with a 10 point system, whether you're a breeder or a breed club, you can kind of make your own cutoffs and, and make it a lot easier to determine which dogs are most valuable, not only individual dogs, but litters, litters um, and um, various groups of offspring. So for example, I'll just throw out a quick example for you. We, I think we, we were able to improve our selective breeding exponentially once we moved to the VHDF system because we were able to identify in particular females that were producing litters of puppies, multiple litters of puppies that were scoring from different sires that were averaging scores at 10 and above. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. So there's no way to see that in with a four point system. No. And I remember when I saw you out at the Highland grounds last summer and you're, you're nice enough to let me walk along figuring I wasn't going to sneak the scores out to the handlers, you know, cause I've been out there before in the field, but <laughs> when, and I just didn't know how your system worked too. And you explained that to me. And that if, if there's one thing that, you know, it nav does. And I, like I said, I, I have the same feeling. I'm a life member of it. But I will badmouth them sometimes. You know, they, they, it's almost like they should have saw that back in the day because when they started it, I'm mean, in the European systems, weren't they always 10 points? Well, when a couple of things, when the, in the European systems, the, the progeny tests are 10 points, but the advanced tests are four points. Okay. So the, the VGP is scored one to four, but the uh, VJP and the HZP are scored one to 10 or right. 11 or 12 in their right. case with in the nose and tracking. But NAVDA, a lot of people don't know way, way back. Um, they act, they went, I think very early on, they had a 10 point system. And then they even went to, you probably heard of the 4-H. Yep, I do remember that. I heard I heard that talk about. Yeah. So they went to a five-point system with the 4-H because they had a four high. Right. Um, and then they, for simplicity, it was just too complicated. They said, no, everything goes to a four. And that, that was before I was judging, admittedly. But, but I knew yeah. a lot of the people that were involved in it back then, including Bodo. Um, who I spent a lot of time with and, right. uh, you know, Gary Whitman in Montana, Jack Lulak and some of these people, but, uh, 
Um, so, yeah. or Jeff, I want to clarify. I just want to put it in a perspective because I know exactly what you're talking about, but I think some listeners won't. And, and I don't, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but if what you said is in, in as a NAVDA judge, we have a range. If, if you've got four scores, you've got four, you've only got four ranges. It's let's call it zero to 25% or 25 to 50, 50 to 75. So if you have a litter of pups that let's call squeaked by with a four, because, and, and this is, this is where I will, this is where I will pick on NAVDA and even fellow judges that I've known over the years, how many times we've heard, Oh, I'm, I'm a low four. <laughs> if, what does that mean? You didn't really like what the dog did, but you're afraid to give him a three, you know, <laughs> and right. that 10 point score eliminates that because you're like, it was all right. It was a good job, but I, I think it's an eight, you know, and that really shows what the judges were thinking because the biggest fault of NAVDA is that prize one NA test. Now when it, all the articles in the magazines, it's like, my dog was a perfect score. My dog was a maximum score. Your dog was not a maximum score. I guarantee it. You know, um, a better reflection of that is you could still be damn proud of a dog with an eight in your system, but you saw some puppies that day that showed like exactly what the standard is or, or exactly what you're looking for. Um, and, and I guess, like you said, as a breeder, if I had a choice of breeding to a, uh, on a judge's scorecard, a low four NAVDA dog and a 10 in the, in the Federation, I got a feeling that dog didn't make a mistake that day, you know, <laughs> even as a puppy, you know? Yeah. No, that, that's, that's well said. And uh, I'll add, if you are looking at a dog from clear across the country to breed to, and you see all 10s and 11s, there's wow. not much of a question there. But if you see all fours, it's like, was that four a 76% or was that 110%? Right. And so that, that leaves a lot of leeway and right. therefore it's just, it's just a more accurate system. And it does have its problems because of the popularity or the commonality of the four point system uh people don't like to get eights they don't <laughs> like nines they want really? tens <laughs> so you can't get past that part right <laughs> <laughs> but um no and, and that goes through all the levels of testing that you do correct not just the uh first one correct correct yeah. all levels and that's and that's the first you know, the question that you asked initially is comp is long and complicated. That's, that's the first piece of it. The second yeah. piece of it is what we call the advanced hunting aptitude test, which would be between your natural ability test and your utility test. Mm -hmm. And this is a test where the dog has to, this is a hunting dog test. So this is a dog now that we're still judging primarily natural ability, but we are now looking at it in a hunting situation where the dog has to be a functional hunting dog. So they have right. to be point, they have to point and hold and be steady enough to shoot birds over. They right. have to retrieve retrieve birds to hand. Um, they have to uh, be able to do blind retrieves in the water, and they have to be able to recover crippled ducks in the water. Um, and it's, it's a really, uh, it's a really cool test for, for lack of a better terminology. I enjoy the test because you still have that young dog that's kind of clicking its heels together and having fun and hasn't been totally beat down through a heavy obedience process. So you get to see a lot of wild action in those dogs and some some really fun stuff but basically what the average hunter would want in the dog you know go right. have a dog point shoot birds over it have them retrieve them um have them retrieve cripples have them retrieve ducks and that sort of thing and yeah and once you once you get to that and I, I i guess i should probably 
let you pick that apart a little bit, but the scoring system in that first test, which we didn't cover, one to 10, there's seven, what we believe seven inherited categories, right? So right. 10 points in each category, 70 points. In the second test, you have those same categories, including search behind the duck and so forth as inherited, but you also now have trained categories like retrieve of shot bird and steadiness. Those right. are trained categories. So in VHDF, we don't pick arbitrary numbers to index each subject like six in nose and two in cooperation, <clears throat> they're all worth two points as a inherited subject. So nose, search, et cetera, is two points. Right, and right. And retrieving and steadiness, et cetera, is worth one point. So you can oh, have wow. a dog yeah, yeah. that is not super well-trained, but highly talented. Yeah. Do really well in the test. That's like a lot of people's real hunting dogs. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. That was the whole point, right? You just said it. Yep. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, yeah, I did, not, I did not pick up that little bit of minutia when I was hanging out with you guys for that afternoon. Um, that's exciting. I like that. It, that makes total sense because the dog's nose is the, he inherited the nose. You didn't make his nose any better. Nope. And and but you showed that while in his development you could also overlay some obedience on on just those things you needed obedience on yeah right yeah right so if you're going to go to the invitational for example um and you you mentioned kyle huff you have kyle huff train your dog um you know you've got a significant advantage um yeah yeah and, and other people, not just Kyle. There's a whole sure. bunch of good ones out there. Yeah. But, but but over over yourself, you know, who's never been to the Invitational before. Right, right. Um, and then it goes on. Your next one is advanced hunting aptitude. Yeah, the and that's that's the advanced hunting aptitude. We we're just we we're just speaking about the the that's the you know, what you'd call the breeder's test or <clears throat> a, a hunting level test. And the third level is the performance evaluation, which That's is right. yeah. Yeah. similar, similar to an invitational test. Um, and the same scoring applies as in the advanced hunting aptitude, but it can be run at any test, at any site, anywhere, which I think is important. That's the other piece is, you know, we don't hunt alone. We hunt together. Yeah. So, you know, to have to get a prize one utility and, and only run in Ohio or Iowa or right. wherever for, for that test, you can run a performance evaluation at any test that you have. And that's where they run in a brace and um, backing is required. They run in a brace for an hour, backing is required and the water work is significant. Three back to back water subjects. There's no break in between the three water subjects which are a blind, a duck search and an independent search or you know a search without a duck where the dog is asked to cover a specific piece of water right <clears throat> right and can you Which, use the same pieces of water or do you try to have separate ones for that no separate pieces of water because we're trying to simulate the three most common scenarios scenarios yeah. that you run into when you're duck hunting you know a dead right. duck you know where it is the dog doesn't mm -hmm. send the dog to the dead duck a crippled duck that is is you know, getting away from the dog or, or you, you, and then the independent search where, you know, you sail the duck down in kind of a general area, you know, it's over there somewhere. Right. Right. 
you know, when I was watching that, um, it, and you can clarify because it, it predates my judging in NAVDA. Um, they used to let the duck, the duck go from the shore and create a sense or, you know, a scent uh, cone, if you will, on the water. And you guys kind of have a blend of what they used to do, right? You don't literally have to send it from the bank, but you kind of simulate the duck being hit. And then the dog, it, it doesn't have to go. That's, that's the, that's the piece that like NAVDA is missing. Like when you could, you could get a, a four in your duck search in NAVDA and just have a dog that likes to go swim. Right. right. But I watched a couple of the dogs literally pick up that scent of that duck. We knew where the duck was. It wasn't hard to remember. And to watch those dogs put their nose on that water, that's as close to real hunting with a dog that you can get right. that part of the test. That's right. In, in the last, the last knob the test that I ran, which I think was 2012, I ran a utility dog and she earned a prize one and in the duck search um, they put the duck in the water about 400 to 600 yards from where <laughs> I sent the dog. Oh, you mean and where I the other, other blind shot their duck? <laughs> yeah, I don't, and I don't, uh, I'm not criticizing that. I probably would have done the same thing as a judge. However, that meant that I was doing an independent search, but right. that's not what the rule book really says. So right. yes, in, in the advanced hunting aptitude test, we, and, it, and, and it's difficult at times, depending on the grounds and the ducks, you know, cause all sure. ducks are not created equal. And no. some people, you know, you just don't always get great great game birds but the goal is to have the duck in the water about 30 yards from the starting point 20 to 30 yards from the starting point and yep. then it it leaves and goes from there and then we send the dog on a blind so you have a blind right roughly 20 yards with no scent to a scent cone right at that point in time yes it's a search behind the duck so right. the dog is using all of its senses it's it's desire it's nose uh it's you know it's eyes it's ears everything to recover that that duck and it is yeah. it is different because we want we expect the duck to be recovered and we want specific engagement with that duck and that scent trail right not just to blow through it and say uh, I, I think I should go look 400 yards away first. <laughs> right. I'm going to go to the other side. Right. Right. So, you know, I, I remember training with Ken Whitney and he started him out like he would kind of tether a duck out and it wouldn't be very far out there. You know, it like, I don't know when that happened when they started putting ducks all the way out to kingdom come, but it did become a thing. Right. And a lot of those dogs that find that duck, they found it because they ran around the bank. You know? <laughs> they, <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't find it because they could smell it on the on the water, you know, and you do throw that in there too. But that part that you, like you said, it's difficult to set up. You, you know, you're not going to, you, you're not going to be able to do 20 dogs on this thing. But if you can get the duck to work right, all that dog has to do is make a, a, a decent first cast and he's going to, if he's got the ability, he's going to get right into a water center. And, and we know ducks stink, let alone those domestic ducks we use, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, that really shows, that shows a, that shows a duck dog out of a versatile dog. It yeah. Really it's, does. It, it's a different, it's definitely, it's a well-defined test and it's a, a different outcome and a different expectation. Mm -hmm. But um, you mentioned Ken Whitney. I, I apprenticed under Ken Whitney um, at least four or five times. And he, he was an excellent teacher. One wow. of the, one of the best. He, I, I, I saw, I went down and saw him a couple of years ago 
and we, we had a, a little recorded conversation and I just, you know, and he's only two hours, maybe three now from me or something. And I just kicked myself like, not that he's ready to die or anything, but um, the conversation th that guy knows his dogs, you know? Yeah. And he, I, I apprenticed under him as well. And he, and we became, I would say pretty good friends. I knew his wife and I'd spend the night at his house and, you know, we'd have some beers, we'd go to the tavern. Now, Ken was never a, you know, hardcore drinker, but he loved having a drink. And he told me because when I was apprenticing, I, I was just struggling to get my dog passed for utility. And I went over to the Harmeyers in Wisconsin for some help and he knew it. And I talked about it. And when it came time for me to put in for application to be a judge, and he was the director of judging and it would have been pretty good if, if Ken just said, yeah, Ron's okay. Let him have it. Right. He said he is going to be a no vote because I went to a professional trainer and he says, how are you going to ask, how are you going to answer handlers questions if you didn't train your own dog? And it, for about three seconds, I had my feelings hurt. And then I realized, holy cow, this guy wants me to be a good judge. And I get it now, you know, he, he was so good. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was, and he's real. I mean, yeah. but the problem was we're in Idaho and um, you know, he's a long way and we used to have to beg him to, to come out here and judge. And, and he did a couple of times and, and uh, it was, he was great. So. I've actually got his old judges hand or his judges diary. He gave me to, he says, I think it was in case he, in case he died, I could write an article in, in the VHD magazine for him. <laughs> yes. He wrote notes about who he apprenticed with. And so I'll bet you, I'll, 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 I'll look that up. I'll bet you I'll see your name and I'll see if he had any snide comments. <laughs> yeah. You'll see Jeff funky and a, a nasty to start with a S S <laughs> probably. Um, I don't uh, know. I, and I know when we talked last summer, um, you know, the the Federation was getting off to a big start and then the, the financial crisis came. And but like I said, I, I want to be involved with it. I miss judging and I would love to get involved with it. And I think I mean, I, I think it's there's so many there's so much need for dog testing out there. Um, if, if people, this is, I don't want to say it's just like NAB, it's not, it's, but it's a, it's a, it's a true versatile hunting dog test. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I can only encourage people to look into it. And I guess the only downside is we just need more of them, right, Jeff? Well, we do. And, you know, we're, we're all, we're all cut from the same cloth, you know, we're partners. Yeah. Um, we're not. We're not contrary to maybe what some people think. We're not. We're not enemies with with NAVDA, and um, I know Dave Trahan really well, and I know he just uh, he's the outgoing president. But you know we've talked a lot over the years, and we've been good friends, and he constantly refers people to me and and uh, to VHDF out here, and he's also involved with uh, you know the. Deutsch Kurtzar and the and and the German right. testing program. So we're all we're all brothers here. And um, I, I would encourage you if you want to kind of have a a fresh perspective of something like VHDF and what it's done for them is um, to talk to either Kyle or Kyle Huff or. Um, Don out there or one some of their chapter members. Yeah. Who, yeah. who I I mean I just talked my ear off uh, last year. They they're still involved heavily in NAFTA and they will be, but this adds a different element for them. And as far as judging and so forth, anybody who's judged versatile dogs as a as a, an official judge like yourself, um if you can make it to the seminar in Pennsylvania, we, you will be brought up to speed 
immediately with that because we we will cover each and every category and yeah. it, it's not it's not it's the same thing it's just what are the standards and you know what what are the factors that that are deemed most important and you know vhdf i think that the other difference that's more nuanced that we haven't talked about from a judging standpoint is it's it's judged to more of a hunting level so if you ask yourself what how would this affect your you know your opinion of the dog in a hunting situation right and if you right. can answer that question because of your past experience as a hunter you can mm -hmm. judge a dog um, yeah and that's the difference well there's no time limits there's no time expectations um everything is done based on what how would this affect a hunting situation would it be good bad indifferent etc and so you 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 can see that in this two-day seminar you you would be totally up to speed i can i can promise you that and they've got a lot of good people out there so yeah i, I just pulled it up on my other computer so april 29th um i i have a four-month planner on my it's the only organized thing I've ever done has been organized. I finally got one of these big whiteboards with four months on it. So when I get hung up here, I got to go, I'm going to get a hold of them people and I'm going to be out there. Cause I, I do miss judging and, you know, and not, not because I like being a judge. I just like the people and the dogs and you learn a little something all the time too. You know, a lot of times you just like, ah, never saw that happen before. You know, it, it, it just expands your, your own, you know, when it comes to training your own dogs, you, you, you get to see so much, so many interesting things that happen. It, it is a valuable education. You, I know a lot of, most breeders are not judges. Uh, most breeders might be trainers and they might run dogs, but they don't judge because it's kind of hard to do all three. I mean, breed, yeah. train, run dogs, judge, but you're right. The, the, the things that I have seen, not only from a training standpoint and a breeding standpoint, it's, it just expands your universe to the point where I, there's no way you could gather and gain that knowledge without going to these, all these tests and seeing right. all these different people. I mean, I I've gone to numerous people and said, how the hell did you train the dog to do that? And, you know, you learn a lot of interesting techniques along along the way and you meet a lot of great people i mean i'm still hunting and and exchanging uh hunts and locations with people that i've met years and years ago so yeah yeah it's been some of my closest friends over the years have been built through navda for sure um yeah i i can't wait to start i can't wait to start doing it jeff i'm excited i'm excited um yeah and, we'd, we'd love to we'd love to have you and get you involved so let's 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 get you going yeah um what i wanted to talk back to uh the the scoring system for a minute um i, I kind of want to pound that nail right through the wood like if you had your nail around with too much air and you pounded the nail through it you know <laughs> um the 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 we talked about the, the one through 10 system, but you also have an 11 and a 12. And I, I imagine it's rare, but I know in the past, especially in, in some utility tests, but in a lot of natural ability tests where I did see a dog that I wish I could give him the old H, right? The, while that was, that was just the best damn dog I saw today, right? He just, my God, he's ready. He's just ready for it. And, how do how do you I shouldn't say determine it's a judgment in the field, but where does the, where does the elevens and twelves come in? What do you, what do you see when? Give me an example of what how yeah. that works. No, that's that's a that's a beautiful question, and I, I wish we could illustrate a scorebook. Oh, um, me too. But I'll, I'll I'll do the best I can without that. So there are three judges, and. Right. In, in NAVDA, 
you've been a judge, so you understand you yep. work towards a consensus. Mm -hmm. um, in VHDF, because each of the subjects are broken down into three point categories. So there's, there's poor, you know, there's poor, fair, good, and excellent. It really is actually just an average. So if you have three judges and um, you have to agree on a category, so let's say you agree on the good category, which mm -hmm. is six, seven, and eight. Right. Uh, if you have one guy at eight, one guy at six, and one guy at seven, you got a seven. It's pretty simple. And you don't uh, have you don't have my buddy Tim Clark arguing with me. <laughs> <laughs> I had to throw that one out there for my buddies. <laughs> uh, I know Tim. I know Tim. I know. I love Tim. I've had quite a few beers with him over the years, but I told him one time, I said, Tim, we'll never judge again together. I said, what? He said, why, Ron? Why? <laughs> I said, I said, because I come out to NAB to events and judge to have fun, and you made it like work today. <laughs> so, <laughs> but go back to that. So, so like, yeah. It's so, if you, so, for an 11, it has to be a performance that is beyond expectations mm -hmm. and for a 12 it has to be beyond expectations under difficult conditions okay and, and i can give you examples of all of that if you want but from a judging perspective you have to have because you are now in the 11 category you have one judge can veto essentially oh, because okay. Because it's only a one point, it's only a one point category. Um, yeah. So now, if two judges are at an eleven and one says no, I'm at a ten. You're at a ten because you okay. got to have three judges to get an eleven. Wow. So it's a very fail safe system. So you don't see many elevens given or many twelves. Right. And the best way maybe I can demonstrate. Um, with an example um i there's one dog that ran and she was the first dog that ever the highest score that's ever been given in the hunting aptitude test is a 75 so that's five points above a 70 so she got 11s or 12s in wow. multiple categories and you know i I won't get into all the details of what she did. I think some of it was she pointed a bird and they couldn't find the bird for like five minutes in some deep grass and she never moved. And, and they finally drug her off the bird and she found three or four more other birds. And then she went back and pointed that one bird again that they never could find. And they finally flushed it and got it out of there and it flew into the woods. And then they went into the woods and found her pointing that same bird again. So it was something like that, but yeah. Um, so down the road, um, a year or two later, there were another male dog that ran and, um, it got a 75 and it, um, track and, and see, you just, you just wouldn't be able to see this in most of the testing venues that are out there, but it tracked a, a chucker that had ran up a hill like 600 yards and oh you know most of the time that dog's probably like disqualified because it left the handler or whatever but it was tracking a bird and it pointed the bird so the judges said handler go flush the bird well that dog stayed on point until that fat ass handler walked 600 <laughs> yards up that hill and flushed that bird and i can say fat ass because it was me and uh, <laughs> i didn't, I didn't I did not own the dog. Um, and then they did a track for the dog. And the that same dog, the pheasant went over literally further than a quarter section. Wow. And it got the bird and retrieved it to hand. So I believe its cooperation was plus 10 it's pointing was plus 10 and it's desire was plus 10. 
And they debated on that dog, I remember, they debated giving the dog a plus a 12 in tracking because of the two tracking instances. And they gave it an 11 and not a 12 because they deemed there were no difficult circumstances in the tracking. It was a cool day, moisture out. And so there was no reason to give it a 12. Yeah. So yeah. those are the things that you can see. And then to, to, you know, not to drag this on too long for you. I hope I can do it quick enough. There was a third dog that scored a 75 over in Washington state. And, and I don't even know all the details of that. I didn't judge it, but it scored a 75. Now let's, let's look at the family tree. The female that scored the first 75 was the mother of the third dog that scored the 75 and the male that scored the 75 was out of uh, the same breeding from a second litter. Wow. Yeah. You, you've got some unbelievable talent there. Just yeah, like I said, the word above and beyond is exactly. Um, but I mean, I can think of small situations as a judge where I would, I would love to, and it sounds funny. I would love to have that, that seven or that eight or that nine, you know what I mean? Because sometimes there's just some luck involved and, and you kind of know, you're like, eh, and you kind of go, well, he got to the bird, he found the bird, you know, but how did he get to the bird? And I, I've seen some pups track that I would have loved to give that. I probably can't say that I've ever seen it in conditions, but you could imagine, I could imagine some extremely dry or windy conditions. We've seen, you know, uh, a 10 pup test where most of the dogs struggled in tracking, right? Just because of conditions and, and for a dog that could pop that off and then do a really long distance. I mean, I would love to have that latitude. Well, I will now once I start judging for you guys. Yeah. Yeah, you <laughs> yeah. will. And, and it is, you're right. At times it's luck. Yeah. But I find to be, to be totally candid i find that most of the time dogs kind of make their own luck um yeah uh, as yeah. another example we ran a test where um there was a a quail had flown the field search was next to a pond that had cattails and there were cattails around the pond and there was a quail that had flew out landed in the cattails and then there was a cottonwood tree right on the edge of the pond. And every we ran, I think, eight dogs, and every single dog went down around that cottonwood tree and kind of nosed around, and they could smell that quail out in those cattails, and they, they moved on. There was right. one dog, the, a short hair, a German short hair pointer, literally climbed up in that tree, went out on a limb in that tree, and went on point. Oh, my God. So it earned an 11 in pointing because nose, I believe, because it resolved the problem. It figured out where the bird was. By yeah. the same token, you say, well, how can a dog get a, 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 an exceptional score in a trained subject like a retrieve by drag? Well, we had one situation that a dog encountered three different herds of deer on a drag track. Oh, my God. And never gave chase and never broke off the track. Just stopped at each group of deer that got up. Deer had, we were late getting through the test. We were out in the field. A bunch of deer had bedded down uh, while we, after we laid the drag track and the dog went out. Each time the deer got up, he stopped. He sat down, he watched the deer and then he continued on and he recovered the duck and brought it back to hand. And so, you know, that's an 11 in the drag track. Wow. Yeah. I, that, that latitude to, to, you know, I, I'd be, I'd be like, I'd be honored to be able to read that score to somebody and explain it to them. You know, um, you, you can have all the, all the, all the, you can have all the fours you want, uh, you know, uh, of course, you know, you know, the problem with that, if Navda adapted it, somebody would say, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to see if there's an opening tomorrow so I can get an 11. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make a prediction that uh, Navda will adopt the 10-point system. 
And the reason I say that is because I just read the latest NAVDA magazine and every single thing that I advocated except the 10 point system has now been indoctrinated in NAVDA and approved in NAVDA, including removing of the walking at heel stakes, which might've also been part of the impetus for the VHDF years ago. Um, but I, I'm willing to bet that 10 point system will be implemented. And I mentioned that meeting in Reno, Nevada, that was all actually brought up. We asked to go to a 10 point system and the answer from the, the board at that time was we can't do that because it will it will foul up our data. It will screw up our 10 point data. I, I heard that many judges workshops too about other subjects. And that is, that's so short sighted on their part. Um, you know, why not improve something? I mean, any change that they made, they were hoping they've changed it for the, a lot of things in the test have changed right over the years. And it was hopefully to, for the better. So why not have a better system? I mean, if, if, if they're afraid of the one guy saying, oh, yeah, well, your breeder's award was based on fours, mine's based on tens, you know what, let those two guys have that argument, you know? Um, I, I think it's just a better, it's, it's a better system. It's a better way. I like well, it. I've always, I think there's something to be said for simplicity. And, um, you know, I think Navda gets involved in a lot of different things and they manage a lot of different things. And, and that's to their members benefit. And yeah. VHDF is a very small organization, um, but it's a very simple organization. They, right. I think they have some of the best judges and the best testing program available. And for people that want to utilize it, they, I, they all seem to find value in it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, now did I, I, I know, there's no way in the world that the Federation is ever going to go the way NAVDA did and decide to be a registry and all the other stuff. That's, this is basically what NAVDA was founded on, right? Originally NAVDA was just a, uh, a training and testing organization. It was never meant to be a registry way back in the day. Well, um, but when I come, when it comes to registry and I don't know if you told me this or if I dreamed it, could a person come to you with an unregistered dog and, enter in your test. Yeah, I, I can speak to that. Um, yeah. First of all, to answer your question, yes, anybody can run any dog in the test. If it's a registered dog with any registry, any registry in the world, mm -hmm. they can run in a VHDF test and the dog will be annotated as a registered dog with such and such registry. Right. If it is a mutt, as we say, not yep. registered, yep. it's just annotated as not registered. And it's the owner and the name of the dog and everything is recorded and the dog can run. Uh, we, we, you know, we didn't get the memo from above as to which dogs are registered or not. So right. whatever, you know, there's a guy out here that runs something called Wessel pointers and he's run a few dogs, um, and that he crossed, uh, German short hair and labs and a few other things and whatever. I'm not, I, you know, Hey, whatever he has the, it'll show up in the scores. Right. So, right. Um, I mean, it's not that he's not, you guys aren't trying to, in, you're, not, you're not trying to encourage like just out crossing dogs and different dogs. But if you've got this good hunting dog and you want it evaluated, you could do it. Right. What if you have a new vision and you want it, a system to evaluate it in? Yeah. You can, you can utilize VHDF. And, yeah. um, by the, by the same. So if it is registered, it's, it's recognized that way. And right. if it's not, it's just, you know, not registered. So. Right. Right. It's just, there's not a category, but it, 
it it gave them the ability. I, I remember one of the things used to come up almost every annual meeting and, and probably sometimes in a judge's workshop. Um, you know, somebody got a German short hair from the pound. They got no papers on it. They loved the hunting with it. They met a NAVDA group. And the poor bastard can't run the dog in the test and he's dying to do it. You know, yeah. that's happened a lot of times. That happens a lot. Yeah. I've seen that yeah. a lot. And, and that there's an, there's another Avenue that they could say like, well, I can run my dog. I can run my dog in the Federation test. Yeah. And, and that's not because, um, the, I, I, I guess we, the reason that that we're not making a push for that, um, right, right. but the reason that occurs is because I can actually speak to the Navda registry because I was on the board when that was a major topic. So the, the reason for the Navda registry, which is actually quite brilliant, um, is that every registry has a different system of numbers and letters to register the dog right so if you're creating a database as jim applegate was right you have to create like our guy who does this for us is frustrated to hell and beyond because he's got already got over 30 different registry entries whereas if you say okay you want to run with Navda? You got to register with Navda. You only have one data field to deal with. Yeah. That's why it was done. Everybody said, oh, it was done as a money play and this and that. And maybe there's a little bit of truth to that. I don't know. But but actually, the reason was data efficiency. It's too hard to maintain a database where you're recognizing 50 different registries. Right. And so if you require right. them to register with Navda, you just have that one Navda number, GW right. or BSP one one one. You know. Yeah, I, I get that for sure. But I I like the fact that it it came up a lot that if you did get, I mean, I I got my first short hair from a buddy who had a pregnant female short hair. Right. There was there was no papers, um, but if she was really a good dog, which she wasn't. I, and I and I got involved with you know the friends that were testing dogs. I I just I like the fact that it's you're not encouraging you're not putting an ad out there. Hey, all you all you mixed breed dogs come out and test with us. But you give that person that ability to do that if if that happens to a person. Absolutely. Yeah. And we've had we've had a few you know pointing labs test which which has been interesting because oh my god I didn't know that. Yeah, there's the scores are what you might expect. You know, tens in water, tens in tracking. Um, pointing is quite variable, and um, but almost always a three or less in search. Because it's just the demeanor, the 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 genetics of the dog. They they do not have that. They don't have. You know, and nor I guess nor should they. Uh, you know course if it's a pointing lab you're yeah boy that's a, we should have a whole episode about pointing labs jeff <laughs> <laughs> but but i remember that came up in a judge's workshop and i remember bob said that is a uh that is that is never going to happen in nabna and i'm sure it probably won't um but they were able to as long as they said hey you could explain the score to them and say this is what we're looking for yeah your dog did your dog did point but we didn't find it very intense or your dog did search, did find birds, but it, you know, it was, you know, it was, this is what you got for the score. But no, I, I like, I like that. I mean, I, I think it's I'm not trying to say we need to be all inclusive, but you know, if, if people want to see how their dog stacks up and, and, and get, get it evaluated, that's, there's nothing better than that. Yeah. I, I don't see what it matters where the dog comes from or what its background is or any of that. I mean, that's just purely discrimination the way i see it so right um well that that's unbelievable how how was your are you guys covered up in snow up there where I, i'm trying to think what part are you still near boise Jeff? yeah i'm i'm nampa and damn we've had 
it we the in the month of I think the month of February it snowed every single day and that was like a record. Now it didn't snow a lot, but, but it just yeah. kept snowing and it's been a cold. It's going to be 25 tonight, which is discouraging because I usually get a little break in between hunting season and training season to do some smallmouth bass fishing, but uh -huh. it's been tough with this, with this weather. So, yeah. And then you're going to go and you, uh, you full-time, you train, not just for testing, but you, are you a full-time trust or a full-time training kennel, Jeff? I've been a full-time training kennel since 1998 and okay. we're, I'm phasing out the, the training. We're slowly, I'm trying to, I'm only dealing with existing clients right now and we're, mm -hmm. we're slowly, um, getting out of the, the training business. So are you, are you, in other words, you're finding your sanity then? <laughs> Yeah, exactly <laughs> that is it's I easier i find it a lot easier to stand on the bow of my champion bass boat and and fish for bass than i do to having a 75 pound wire hair dragging me around all over the place so <laughs> yeah you'd rather drag them all over the hills looking for birds instead of them dragging you around in a training oh situation. and i won't quit doing that but that that won't happen i will do that to the day i die but but i don't that that's all fun and one of these days one of these days you got to get your ass out here and i'll see if i can kill you well i'm telling you i i i was getting a little i was getting a little fat and i i had a few i went to a motel and i had one of those mirrors that were in front of the bathroom and this is about two months ago i'm like who the fuck are you? <laughs> so, so I found a jujitsu oh. school and I'm getting back in shape. So I'm going to, I'm older than you, but I'm coming because one of my good friends just moved to Boise. Really? And yeah. And then I'm also going to come out. I we're I'm working on some other projects, filming projects, and I want to do an interview with Bob, uh, one with some cameras. And I want to, I want to segue that into, um, the wire hair Alliance. Like a lot of people who listen to this, Bob's been on my podcast at least three times, probably been on everybody else's podcast at least once. And they talk about the, the poodle pointer Alliance, which, um, you know, was a, I, it, for in a nutshell, a bunch of like-minded breeders that set their own bars for themselves, for their breeding standards using NAVDA testing scores. And, uh, and I didn't know this, but, there is a wire hair alliance um and you know you're you're not you're part of it you're you're one of the breeders but do you want to shine a little light on that before i end up having an episode with that down the road yeah that the wire hair alliance is a um absolutely um growing and um fantastic organization most, I would say almost anybody who's breeding, hunting wire hairs are now involved in the Alliance mm -hmm. and the collaboration is phenomenal. That's what, you know, in the old days, it was like everybody hated everybody and everybody bad mouthed each other's dogs. And with the Alliance, we, we all just share information about, all the dogs and it's not it's not as formalized as it could be yet right um, in other words we don't have a specific like software piece of software that can that people can put everything into but we right. all know each other's um um inbreeding coefficients we know uh th we have to test for thyroid hips um, we talk about elbows, we talk about, um, coat and, and then all of the, the, I think the most important thing is what you don't see in any of these tests. So, you know, these outliers, 
and you, these outliers pop up and you start seeing them and somebody, we're, we do a Zoom meeting every couple of months and we all get on there. And if anybody has seen anything genetically or what have you, they, they speak about it versus I think in the old days, it was kind of hidden. And yeah, 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 wanted to just protect themselves. And a lot of dogs were bred that had diseases or genetic conditions that shouldn't have been right. bred. And now I think we're all kind of protecting each other and, and helping each other out. And it, it's, we're learning a lot and we've got a long way to go, no doubt. But um, when we started, I know that critics called us a marketing organization, but from what I've seen, we've mostly been a health and genetics organization. So right, it's, and, it's, and you know, being able to converse with other breeders, like you said back in the day, was people kind of kept it close to the vest. But I, I would imagine a wire hair breeder from another part of the country gets on one of these Zoom rooms. He might find out that you got a dog that he wants to use, and you guys can talk about the coefficiency. You can. It, it's given those breeders. Um, uh, uh, it's like it's like when the internet got open to all of us, right? It's like, it's, it's opening the communication line. And if we're talking about a breed of dog, I, I, it's like, if I was God and I had to swipe my hand down, like every sporting dog group should have an alliance and people shouldn't be afraid to talk to their fellow people. Or it's, it's like, it's like me with the podcasting world. You're like, I was the first one with the upland podcast and there's dozens of them now. And the main ones we're all friends, you know, and we talk about what to do and who's your guest going to be. And we're not keeping anything close to the vest. We're, we're just embracing it. Um, I think that's great because the, you know, wire hair, I guess it would be the second most popular dog in NAVDA, right. In in registry, I would guess in the versatile world. Uh, yeah. I don't know anymore. I think you probably have Griffon, Poodle Pointer, oh, Short Hair. Yeah. Not, not in that order, but I, I would yeah. say the fourth. But but you're right um, in that um, unquestionably, I mean, you have um, Dominic Bachman, who is a senior judge now for NAVDA, is heavily involved in the Wire Hair Alliance and contributing, mm -hmm. and um, Kelly Jobes and uh, Jeff Miller and, you know, people like Greg Schmeding and... Uh, a number of others who are all contributing. And so it's, it's an open forum versus yeah, yeah. this little secret, you yeah, know, yeah. society, dog eat dog um, world that, that we, I think existed in before. And yeah. It's just, I, 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 I can speak from experience when I got into this silly breed called the Bracco Italiano about 15 years ago. And I met with some of the breeders in the club. Immediately. I put a, like a, a letter together. I probably still have it in a file. And I was quoting what Bob Ferris did. I said, we can have a parent club. That's fine. But I think the people who are breeding should get on the same page and create an alliance. If, You'd have thought I was asking them for their weight and their measurements and what size, you know what I'm saying? Those, <laughs> yeah. they, they were so like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't like her. She doesn't like me. He doesn't like me. He does. I'm like, oh, my God. It would have been the best thing for a newer breed coming into the country. Yeah, because you can do so, you can oh, do so, so much, much to help each other. And I, I feel like in, in 19... You know, 94, it was, you know, breeding and training dogs was a dirty, petty, incestuous little business. And now yeah. I feel like it's just a big collaboration of people yeah. trying to do the right thing through the alliance. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more, you know. And, and like I said, uh, 
a, a minority breed coming into this country, I think that's the first thing. If, if there's only two of them, like if there's only whatever the new breed is, those two breeders should start an alliance, set some goals for themselves, raise the bar every few years and, and become best friends. And it's only going to help the breed and the buyers. Yep. That that's the beauty of it because if you work together, your gains are exponential. And if you work against each other, um, it's all lies and it's hidden yep. and you don't know what's happening. So, right. Yeah. You get those people calling for puppies and, and they said, uh, do you know any other breeders? No, I don't know any other breeders and we're not going to have a litter till next year. And I know with, with the Poodle Pointer Alliance and I'm, I'm new to the Wire Hair Alliance, but you know, they're, they're all, they all got each other's backs, you know, and again, with any club, there's always going to be an outlier. We don't worry about outliers. We just get rid of them. But the, the idea that if, if I've told people and I, you know, you can imagine how many emails I get, Jeff, that sound like this. Hey, Ron, long time listeners show. I'm going to get a dog. I used to have this and now I want to get a dog. I'm thinking of, and they'll go, I'm thinking of a Griffin, a Vigila or a Springer. <laughs> Okay. Well, you, you just, you got to quit listening to my episodes. First thing I tell them, but, but if they can go to an alliance, which keeps away from being the parent club, they're, they get to see all the breeders. They're all there on one page and they can contact them all. They can see, you know, it, it, it the customer experience is tenfold better. Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard that a lot about, you know, our, our wire hair Alliance, I get a lot of people that call and they're looking for a puppy. And I say, you know what, just call the other Alliance breeders on the website. And they're a lot of times they're like, well, yeah, we already have. And, um, we've, we've chosen you or whatever, but I tell them, I, I don't think they can go wrong with any breeder on that website. And, you know, that's, that's the honest truth because those people have committed to breeding a high quality dog. I mean, why else would you join? Right. You're, you're not there. Cause you're like, well, I got some shitty dogs. I wonder if they'll have me. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, Jeff, we could go on forever and we did, well, we didn't almost go on forever. Um, do you ever get out of Idaho other than to judge something or do you just, is Idaho the sportsman's paradise? No, I, Hey, listen, I, I, I go to Florida and fish. I got buddies there. I get, I get, um, I will be in Pennsylvania a couple of times this year because we're doing the judges seminar there in at yep. the end of April. And then they have a test, I think June 10th, roughly. I'll be there for that. Um, okay. And yeah, I, I do judge in Minnesota and Michigan and, and so forth. But um, uh, Hunting uh, I hunt too. birds. I hunt birds and fish wherever I can. So that, that includes a lot of different places. Well, we, we need to uh, give me about six more months on the mat and I'll hunt with you this fall. We'll see if I can walk you into the ground. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love that. I'd love that. <laughs> I won't have <laughs> you you still got good knees, Jeff? You know, I'm lucky. I'm I'm I've always been kind of a a big a little bit of a bigger person, but my knees and hips are stellar. So, you can't mess with those. I can I can I get war Let's put it this way. If we start hunting about 9 a.m., I'm I'm reaching my peak speed about 3 p.m. I'm just getting warmed up about 3. Ooh. <laughs> And do you, do you actively, because I, I, I saw you last summer, do you actively chuck or hunt because it's Idaho or do you, is that still one of them? Like, eh, that's a, a 40 year old guy's game. Do you still actively chuck or hunt? No, I hunt every single day of the season. I, oh my I, God. my business is designed around um, chuck or hunting. I train bird dogs from March until Blue grouse opens uh, right about September 1st, actually a couple days before that. 
and then I hunt the entirety of the season and I, I don't quit and I, I don't intend to quit. And, um, it's, it's, it, not only is it a physically challenging environment, but it is a incredibly scenic environment. I mean, I never ceases to amaze me. The, the things that I see out there, the wildlife and everything else. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a passion. No question about it. Jeff, it sounds like you've tailored your dog training and hunting. Like you tailored your college career. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Well, I, you know, I can, I have to, I have to give credit where credit is due. I got to give credit to my wife for that. Heidi, she, she works and, um, she supports what I do and the dogs. And that's probably the main reason why I can do it that way. So, well, you know, I, I think the only other guy I talked to, and this is, I think in my first, first year of podcasting, the guy who designed the, the gunner kennel <clears throat> and he decided what college he was going to go based on to go based on duck hunting. So <laughs> yes, I, don't, I think you, you did it before he did, but that apparently with some kids, their, their college path, there, there's some influences there that, uh, that have a, a stronghold. <laughs> yep. That's that. It was exactly my design for sure. I mean, uh, Moscow, Idaho, you got, um, the Kendrick grade and the Genesee Hill for, uh, quail, chucker, huns, and, uh, yep. Steelhead fishing and all that right there. Uh, yeah, it was wonderful. Not only that, I also back then, I, you know, I've listened to, um, whenever I'm on a plane, especially I listen to your podcast and I just go down the line and I catch what I can. And you do a lot of hound guys, um, I used to be a a hound guy. I ran, uh, I ran lion, mountain lion for a long time. And in fact, uh, at one point in time, caught the seventh biggest lion by Boone and Crockett standards in, in this country. So no shit. You, you had some, what kind of hounds did you have? I ran blue tick strain hounds. I have a neighbor. He lives, we're on, you know, pretty big, not big properties, but everybody's a small property here would be five acres. And my neighbor who we're cordial, we know each other for years. We just, we just don't hang out. You know, he, he was a second shift worker and he just retired. So I think we're going to start becoming buddies, but his dad um, is one of the most well-known coon dog people in the Midwest. His name is Frank get his dad's name is Frank Giddings and he runs Walker hounds. And I'm going to be doing a podcast with his dad, his dad's in his eighties and Jeff, he still goes out every night and does some hunting with his hounds. Yeah. That, I'll tell you what, there, there is nothing more strenuous than oh. hound hunting. Mm. And I had a couple of walkers too in my day, but my favorite were Sebastian strain blue ticks because of their loud voice and their grittiness. But um, I, when I got into bird dogs, I, I tried to keep my hounds going, but I just, you can't, you can't do both. It's, it's too much. And, oh, yeah. Um, That's, yeah, but I, I love, I, I've, I've put countless mountain lion in a tree. I, I only killed two in my entire life. And, um, one was the first lion I ever caught with my own dogs that I trained. And uh, old Chelsea, that utility prize one dog that we talked about at the beginning of the podcast was mm -hmm. on that hunt. And, um, and then the only other one I shot was that monster Tom, which was number seven Boone and Crockett at one wow. point in time. And uh, we shot that one, but uh, treed many, many, many lions over the years up on the Selway and the Locksaw rivers in, in Idaho and uh absolutely used to love that to death but boy you got to be in shape for that i'll tell you what. well I, I would imagine the reason frank can do it because we're at 600 feet of elevation and there is not even a bump of a hill here in michigan so <laughs> you know 
but we got swamps and rivers, you know? Yeah, it's you got brush and swamps and all that stuff. So it's never, they don't go when an animal is trying to elude its, uh, you know, the the hound, they don't, they don't make it easy. Evade. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So, yeah, well, that yeah, that's a whole nother piece of it. When I listen to your your podcast, I'm like, yeah, we, that, there's that too. The the whole hound part of it. So yeah, I got I've got to do more of that. I got to I actually got to do more hound stuff, and this will be good because uh, once I get Chuck coming over here, you know those guys are they're as crazy as we are, and and you know like when you're bird hunting, you can just kind of tap out. You can just say yeah, I'm good, but if you let some hounds go. You're in it for the, for whenever it's over. Oh, you know what I mean? You, you are yeah, committed. you're, you're committed. You got to get them out of the bush. But yeah. I will say this, I on more than one occasion after I had the bird dog, the wire hair. You know, we hunt in North Idaho. We hunted primarily in snow, so you could track the hound. And, yeah. and always find your hound, assuming you could physically get there. Whereas in, you know, like Arizona and places where there's very little snow, they're dry ground tracking. But one of the things I learned with, with the wire hair that proved useful, uh, we'd, we'd, I'd run Cooter and Sylvie, the hounds, and they'd they might go across dry ground and I couldn't track them, but guess what? Chelsea would. So I used the bird dog to track the coon hounds or the lion hounds yeah. to get me to the tree. So it was a, a relationship, a triple relationship and it actually worked out pretty well. Do, do you think you could have taken a wire hair and made it a lion dog? A, a, a true lion dog no because no. only on a very short race if you if you had a lion that crossed the road in front of you yeah you could you could tree that lion with with the wire hair but they don't run independent of you so they you know they're only gonna go as you know a bird dog has cooperation they hunt with right. you a right. hound has zero cooperation. <laughs> they don't. They don't hunt with you. <laughs> they hunt you for hunt, the for the game. You hunt with them. You hunt yes. With them. <laughs> yes. Follow hound. That's it. <laughs> so you could you could get a wire hair that could get lucky, but uh, he's just not going to track something for five miles away. Look no. at the eye. That would be. I, I've happen. always said though. I I did have a young wire hair once that a friend of mine, he saw him run and he said. You know, I think I could turn him into a coyote dog. <laughs> if they're that independent, then they're probably oh, yeah. useful as a bird dog. But now no, you're right. Said that, you're right. I, he, he was he was a terrible bird dog. <laughs> <laughs> but if you got lucky, you found him on point somewhere, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And you know, that dog, I ended up giving it to a guy and uh, he loved that dog, but I'm like, <laughs> that dog is way too much work for me. <laughs> he must've yeah. had a little, he must've had a little red bone or blue tick or something in him. Yeah. And I have had, you know, I've had two different wire hairs tree bobcats while I was chucker hunting. Um, really? Yeah, but bobcats, they, you know, it's a different, situation than a lion they don't um you know a lion covers a lot more territory than a bobcat does so yeah what do you who's who's gonna win in a wire hair bobcat match oh i you know i the bobcats are the the wire the one wire hair that tangled with the bobcat that i had um uh, she put the herd on the bobcat pretty bad and um, when it came out of the tree. But that same little wire hair was a gritty, gritty dog. And she also, one point in time, killed a badger. So 
you know <laughs> i don't know i think it depends on their personality <laughs> yeah yeah, I guess a, a good hound is supposed to be a little, they, they got to be gritty, but you don't want them to be stupid, right? You don't want them to be in their mouth. And well, yeah, the yeah. Hairs that I've had would probably think they could be in their mouth and still win. <laughs> and that, that is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, if they get too close, they're, they're going to die. And I've actually, I've seen that with, with some of the hounds too. Um, they get too close and they get clipped and um it's it's not pretty so no that's a tough that's a tough road well i'll stick to hunting birds i guess and i'm not i'll i'll get rid of all my grandiose plans of getting one more wire hair to go coyote or coon or bobcat hunting with <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah, jeff I, 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 i'd I, stick I, to the easy stuff too at this point in time i I've right. got no intention to go back to lion hunting, although I wouldn't mind one more good race um, in my lifetime to, to see it out. But uh, we do that every day, hunting chucker. So, yeah. All right. Listen, I'll let you go. I'm going to get a hold of everybody. I'm signing up for the uh, judges seminar. Our pass will meet here again this year. Sounds good. All right, buddy. Thanks for coming nice. on and thanks for sharing everything. Yeah. Pleasure and an honor nice talking to you, my friend. All right. You have a good night, Jeff. Take care. Bye.